So this final piece of armor is the, is the Bible as it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. But here's what we need to be clear about. You don't have the sword of the Spirit simply because you have a Bible. Simply because we have a Bible, it doesn't mean that we have the sword of the Spirit. Why not? Because what the Greek says here when biblical authors wanted to refer to the whole Bible, all of its parts, and all of its books, and all of its chapters and verses, the Greek word that they use was called logos. Some of you might have logos Bible software. Logos refers to the entirety of the written word, right? Logos. That's the entirety of the written word. The sword of the Spirit is Rama, a rhema. And there's a difference between logos, the entirety of the written word, the entirety of the Bible that you hold in your lap, and rhema. And when they talk about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, they're talking about rhema. Now, what is the difference between logos and rhema? What is the difference between logos and rhema? Logos refers principally to the total inspired word of God. That's the entire Bible. That's the logos. Rhema is a verse or portion of scripture that the Holy Spirit brings to our attention with application to a current situation or need for direction. Logos, the whole Bible. But that's not the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's just the Logos. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is that rhema. It's that revelation of Scripture that God breathes into your heart to be applied to a specific situation, circumstance, or context. You see, if Paul meant that the sword of the Spirit was the Bible, he would have used that word logos, but he didn't. He used the word rhema, which shows us that the sword of the Spirit is the individual verses and phrases and passages of the Bible which we can wield quickly in battle, which, can be th which, which we can thrust and stab with force into a weak spot of the enemy. Because remember, he's using the analogy of the Roman soldier, and that sword was for close hand-to-hand -hand combat, and for thrusting, thrusting. And the sword of the Spirit is those portions of the Scripture that the Holy Spirit has infused into your heart, infused into your spirit, that when the enemy comes and attacks, you ain't retreating. You're thrusting. I always told you, I memorized Scripture when I first got saved, not to memorize Scripture, not to run around quoting scripture to people and arguing, debating with people. I memorized scripture so I could stay off them streets. And so when the temptation came for me to get high again, right, this is what I would do. I would thrust my sword. What shall I say then? So I continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall I who am dead to sin live any longer therein? What was I doing? I was thrusting my sword. But see, you don't have a sword if there's nothing in there. You don't have a sword. It's, it's not, well, 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 hold on, let me, let, me, let, me, let me run in my Bible. Let me, let me. Because what happens when you turn your back in battle? You bust over the head. You need to be able to stand and be ready. That's what he's referring to when he's talking about this sword of the spirit. He's talking about this word, this revelation of scripture and how to apply scripture to the specific contexts of our life that is directed and guided by the spirit. It is what is breathed by the spirit into our lives, into our hearts, ready for that specific circumstance and situation. Remember when the enemy came up against Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus didn't just give him logos. What did Jesus give him? Jesus gave him rhema. Jesus thrusted at him with the sword of the spirit. He was hungry. The devil said, well, I'll tell you what. You can turn them stones into bread. I know you're hungry. 
I know you got power. Turn them stones to bread. Jesus thrusted them. Boom! Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, not logos, every rama that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all. Jesus thrusted him. Again and again, three times he thrusted him. See, if we don't got no thrust, there's nothing to keep him up off you. See, and that's what's been happening for many of us. We're in this battle, and we don't have no thrust. We have defensive weapons, but we don't have nothing to keep them up off us. You ever see boxing, right? A good boxer, what's he got? Larry Holmes was champ for what, seven, eight years? Larry wasn't fast. Larry didn't throw a lot of combinations. Larry didn't dance. What did Larry do? Larry had a jab. Keep him off him, thrust him, boom, boom, boom. And he went round by round by round. That's how we have to think about the sword of the spirit. It's what we thrust to keep the enemy off us. Look what Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says. For the word of God is living and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Dividing asunder soul and spirit, piercing to the joint and marrow, bones, discerner, the very thoughts and the tents of the heart. Therefore, all things are open and naked before him whom we have to do. In other words, you can't hide nothing from this word. It's living. It's alive. Why? Because it's the sword of the spirit. It is what the spirit has breathed. And when you speak that thing to your circumstance and situation, you're speaking life into your circumstance and situation. But that thrust speaks death to the enemy. Y'all got this? The sword of the spirit, our only offensive weapon that we have. It's not just knowing the Bible. It is having specific Portions of scripture that are designed to attack, to dismantle, to destroy specific onslaughts of the enemy that are spirit inspired. That when it comes, it comes from your spirit and you speak that thing. So I lost my place. I don't know where I'm at. So. Let's talk about how do we use this sword. Because the Roman soldier, one of the first things he was trained in was how to use the sword. You know, I spent a little time in the army. Didn't finish, but I spent a little time. <laughs> and one of the things that we did, before they even put us on a tank, we spent three months learning about a tank. And I was like, dang, we ever going to get to drive one? <laughs> learning to use your weapon, learning about your weapon. You see, our responsibility is to learn the word and only then will he help us remember it and help us use the word correctly in the right situations and in the right ways. And when we do this, the word of God becomes powerful and effective. It can do many things for us and accomplish many victories for us. This is what Paul was talking about when he wrote to Timothy in chapter 2, verse 15, here in 2 Timothy. He said, Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. Well, why would this worker need to be ashamed? Look at the next portion of that scripture. One who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. See, when I can't handle that word of truth, when I can't handle that sword of the spirit, when I can't handle that rhema, that spirit inspired word for a circumstance or situation, I am put to shame. Why? Because I won't have victory over my enemy. I won't be able to live the victorious life, the overcoming life, the God designed life that God determined for me when he brought me into the kingdom. I won't be able to fulfill my purpose. And people look at me and they'll say, oh, they just go to church. 
but I don't see nothing different in their life. They ain't, go, they, 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 they ain't got no more victory over their stuff than I got. That's what he means when he says, one does not need to be ashamed. Shame because we're not living the potential that God has for us because we won't put on the armor, because we won't fight back, because we won't thrust our sword. So we have to know how to correctly handle the word of truth. In order to know how to handle the word of truth, we got to be secure and confident in what that word can actually do for us. I got like 20 minutes left, and I'm going to see if I can get through this. So what can this sword do? What can this sword do? Number one, it destroys Satan's arguments. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Watch what it says. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Sounds like the beginning of our text in Ephesians. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Why? For the weapons of our warfare are not what? Carnal, not fleshly. It's not your strength. It's not your ability. It's not your perseverance. No, it's what we receive from God. They are not carnal, but mighty in God for what? Pulling down strongholds. See, you know what them strongholds are? Mm. See, strongholds are spiritual, legal territory that has been established in our lives and in our families where the enemy has rule and authority. See, some of us, if you look at our families, we see, we see a certain struggle, a consistency of struggle. That's called a stronghold, right? Because, you know, grandma, granddad, Uncle Willie, Uncle Joe, sweet Aunt Mary, you know, when she was young, she was running around creeping and deeping, and, and it released stuff spiritually into our family. And now we, we, we struggle with things, and we think those struggles originate with us, but nope, it's those principalities and powers. It's those rulers. And the only way that you can overcome that stuff is the sword of the spirit. So watch this. It's mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Look at the next verse. And casting down arguments and every high thing that assaults itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought arguments, every high thing, and bringing every thought into the captivity of obedience of Christ. What is this sword of the Spirit, this rhema, this God-inspired use of verses and scripture for specific circumstances and situations? It's able to attack the arguments, the, 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 the things that the enemy tries to speak into our heart, tries to speak into our mind, those voices that keep coming back from the past, those things that tell us we'll never be nothing, never do nothing, have, never have nothing, circumstances and situations won't change, he'll never change, she'll never change, your kid are going down a road and ain't nothing that's going to stop them. Those are arguments. And they argue against the truth of God that's buckled around our waist. The arguments, it's the things that the enemy comes and tries to tell us and convince us that what God said is a lie. Arguments. And so when the enemy comes and says this, the spirit will give you a rhema to say that. But he can only bring back to your remembrance whatsoever things you have been taught. But if you've never been taught, you got nothing to bring back. That's why you got to be in a teaching church. You can't just be in a church where there's a whole lot of singing and hooping and hollering and you walk out all emotionally filled and you got nothing to thrust with. Nothing to combat those arguments. So the sword of the spirit, the rhema, it can destroy Satan's arguments. What else can it do? This sword is able to pierce men's hearts. See, a lot of times, I used to do this when I was young and on fire for the Lord. You know, we used to go street, street witnessing me and Pastor Gus, and we, we, we try to argue somebody down to salvation. 
Try to try to, you gonna get saved today. Like Kevin Hart said, you're gonna learn today, you're gonna get saved today. And I ain't leaving until you say the sinner's prayer. And then I realized folks will say the sinner's prayer just to get rid of us. <laughs> folks weren't getting saved. And then we go home bragging, oh man, we want nine people to the Lord today. <laughs> the only thing that can pierce a person's heart, watch this. Back to Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Watch this. Piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit. That word. That word. When you allow the Holy Spirit, when you're talking to someone that's not a believer, and you're talking to that person, and you allow the Holy Spirit to direct your conversation, you ever notice he will give you a word. He'll give you something to say. And it'll be like an arrow straight to that person, straight to the depths of that person's heart. Boom! And it don't take much. That word, that sword, can divide asunder of the soul and spirit. Get down right into a man's heart. The Bible says of the Holy Spirit that, he's, that his ministry is to convince men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Yeah. Of sin because they believe not on the only begotten of the Father, of righteousness, Jesus said, because I go to my Father, and of judgment because the God of this world has been judged. The only one who can do that is the Holy Spirit, but what he uses are those thrusts of the living word, those thrusts of the rhema that we utilize to pierce an open man's heart. You can't argue people into salvation. You can't browbeat people to come to church. That ain't gonna work. Third thing that this sword can do Third thing this sword can do, the sword inspired by the Spirit, utilizing specific portions of Scripture that have been embedded in our heart and spirit that the Holy Spirit breathes on and brings to the surface and brings to our remembrance for specific persons and situations and circumstances. Third thing it can do is it can transform the believer. See, the only way to take up the sword is to immerse ourselves in the word of God. There are no shortcuts or fast tracks. The only way to take up the sword of the spirit is to spend as much time as you possibly can in the word. Read it, study it, memorize it, talk about it, meditate upon it, pray it through, think about it. Can't just be a Sunday morning thing. Because when I'm able to do that, watch, watch what happens. Look at Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17 says this. It says, so then faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing. And hearing by the what? Word. That's not logos. That's rema. Hearing by the inspired, spirit-directed word of God. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. I love this verse. Oh, I love this verse. Watch this. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, <laughs> watch this, you accepted it, not as a human word, say it ain't me. Don't, don't, don't tell people come to New Vision because of Dave Jones. Because those of you who've been here, the only thing I'm talking is what? Word. That word, that's why we use a lot of scriptures. You go to some churches, you'll get a scripture in the beginning, and then for the next 45 minutes, it's man. Ain't no life in that. Right? Am I lying? Watch. Watch this. He said, he said, he said, you received the word, you heard it from us, and when you heard it from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but watch, but as it actually is the word that is Rema of God. Now watch, which is indeed at work in you who believe. It's at work in you. See, 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 this sword of the spirit, this rhema, that thing gets down in you. And it starts working in you on when you give it to somebody else. It has life on it. But if it's this word that you just studied to argue, studied to debate, and you haven't allowed it to work on you, when you try to give it to someone else, there's no life on it. Which is indeed at work in you. 
Is he working on you? Are you under construction? Is stuff being torn down, rooted up, turned over, rebuilt? It's a wonderful thing. Listen, I, I, man, listen. Whew. I, listen, I, listen, I'm still being worked on. I still got walls being torn down, foundations being ripped up, still. But man, when he's working on you, the pressure is great, man, but there's nothing like it. I remember this song by Steve Green. Y'all don't know Steve Green. Y'all don't know Steve Green. This is when I used to call myself a singer. And my wife was like, I don't like none of that stuff you used to sing. It was that contemporary Christian stuff. But Steve Green used to sing this song. Um, there burns a fire of sacred heat, white hot with holy stone. And all who, and all who dare pass through its flame will not emerge the same. Some as bronze, some as silver, some as gold, then with great skill, all are hammered by their sufferings on the anvil of God's will. He is refining my soul, refining and making me whole. No matter what I may lose, I choose the refiner's fire. See, when God's working on you, when you're allowing the rhema of God to work on you, when things start coming up in your life, when your flesh starts trying to resurrect itself and you start speaking the rhema of God to your flesh, to your circumstances and your condition, and you start seeing that word work, man, too. Is it working in you? Because you ain't letting it work in you. You'll never have rhema. You never be able to thrust that sword at the enemy. So the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, it's the sword that is given to us by the spirit. God breathed, God inspired. It is the rhema that the Holy Spirit, because we have memorized and we have internalized the word, We've yielded to the word to allow it to shape and direct and conform our lives. We've meditated on the word. We've studied on the word. We've sat before the word. And now there's substance in us for the Holy Spirit to now breathe on and inspire so that when the attack of the enemy comes, we can thrust Amen. that sword. When there's chaos in my house, I can thrust the sword. When my finances are acting up, I can thrust the sword. A sword of the spirit. My only offensive weapon that I have. But it's deadly and it's effective. Now, I want to close with this. I want to talk about the sword and mothers. I couldn't leave y'all hanging. Luke one thirty eight. Mary. We'll talk about Mary in the Protestant church that much, right? But Mary was a woman of great faith. Mary was a woman of tremendous faith. And when the angel of the Lord came to Mary and said, hey, Mary, listen here. You won't get pregnant by the Holy Ghost. Mary's response to all that revelation and the child that you're going to have, he, he, he's going to be the Messiah, and, and, and all these things are going to happen and transpire through this child that you're going to have that's going to be the result of you being impregnated by the Holy Ghost. Mary didn't say, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Mary's response, watch this. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me, watch this, according to your, according to your rhema. Mary yielded her heart. She yielded her life. She submitted her will to the revelation of rhema that God gave her. And that was the sword of the spirit. Because once Mary became pregnant, 
She was engaged. Now she's walking around with a belly. Ain't no wedding yet. I bet folks was in the village. Did you see Mary? Mm, yes, I did, girl. Mm, she been trying to hide it, but I saw, I saw her at the well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's supposed to be engaged to Joseph, but mm, I, don't, mm, I don't know, girl, girl, what you think? Mm, yeah, you know what kind of family Mary come from. I knew it all along. That she heard the whispers as she walked through the village. Time and time again. But I bet what Mary did, when the enemy tried to cause a lack of confidence in the word that God gave her, I bet when Mary was alone and the enemy was working on her, because you know how we get alone yes. and he work on us. And then what we do, and I'm guilty of this from time to time, we just lay there and just let him have his way up and all up in here. We just, we just yield to it. Right? I bet what Mary did, Mary pulled out her sword. Be it unto me according to thy word. My child shall save nations. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. I bet she pulled out that sword through the whole ordeal. And when Joseph came and found out she was pregnant, and considered, can you imagine the conversation? The Bible doesn't tell us anything. It just says Joseph considered divorcing her. Joseph came and said, you pregnant about who? What? Hmm. Him. I ain't that spiritual, Mary. I'm sorry. I ain't, I, 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 I ain't, that, I ain't that spiritual. And while Joseph was considering, I bet Mary just kept thrusting. Just kept thrusting just kept thrusting that sword until that rhema she received manifested itself. Moms, what sword are you thrusting? Some of us, we got grown children. I tell, I, I tell, I tell parents who have young kids, you ain't started parenting yet. You ain't, listen, I believe you don't start really parenting until that child gets like 14, 15. Because at 14, 15, this this new dynamic that kicks in, and it's called opinion, and they no longer see the world through the filter you frame for them, and they start seeing the world through their own filter and start having their own opinions and their own thoughts, that's when you start parenting. Everything else, you just feed it and clothing them. <laughs> right? But just like Mary, that child you carried in the womb has divine purpose. I believe every child born into the earth, every child entering a mother's womb has divine purpose. The only question is whether we can get that child connected to that purpose. I mean, Cheryl, Cheryl sent me a text a couple of weeks ago. We had this political event. And she sent me a text reminding me of something that happened when I was a kid. I don't remember it. Yeah, I was a kid. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. My eyes turned. I don't know. Something. I ended up in the hospital. Or What happened? I don't remember. But I was almost gone. He's trying to take me out back then. <laughs> Every child has purpose. And the question is, do we connect them with the purpose? And, and here's a point I want to make. Help me, Lord. Help me, help me, help me. That as, as mothers, the example Mary gave us, she received the rhema from the Spirit. And she held on to that rhema through difficult circumstances and trials. And moms, you have a rhema from God. And what you have to learn to do is just thrust. Don't complain, thrust. See, Proverbs says that a woman's words either builds up her house or tears it down. There's nothing more powerful than the word of a woman. 
Nothing more powerful than the word of a mom. Mom's words carry weight. Some of us still hear mom's words echoing in our ears 40 years later. Women, moms, your words are powerful. And the question for us is in the midst of your trials, in the midst of watching your adult children lose their minds, what will you speak? Will you speak the circumstance? Mm, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Ooh, Lord. Ooh, help me. Okay. What we often do is we speak a word not from the spirit. We speak a word out of the frustration of our spirit. And when we speak the sword of our spirit, that, that, that has no life. It only has death, and it only aids and abades the enemy. We have to stop speaking a word out of our spirit and begin to speak a word from the spirit, the sword of the spirit. And we've got to get ourselves to the point where we get in front of that word and we say, Father, I know that you have promises concerning my child. I know you have promises concerning my marriage. I know you have promises concerning my household. I know you have promises concerning me. And Lord, I'm coming to this word. My expectation and faith is that you will breathe rhema into me. And so when those circumstances come up, you're able to do what, ladies? You're able to thrust. 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 I learned a valuable lesson from my wife. When our girls were in college, I was tripping. Every Friday night, I'd be tripping. Calling them, they ain't answering. Texting them, they ain't answering. I'm wondering who, where they at, what they doing, who they doing it with. Right? At 1230 at night, 1 o'clock. Ain't that in? And Tracy would say, I'm going to sleep. Well, she's, 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 I don't know, I already prayed and covered them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was stressing, and what was she doing? She was thrusting, thrusting, thrusting. Moms, your words are powerful. God called you to be, listen, you ain't a mother by accident. You ain't a mother by accident. It's not the net result of some other activity. Because the kid's upstairs listening, so I got it. <laughs> Regardless of the circumstance, that was divinely ordered by God. And you have to believe that there's a divine purpose and that there are promises connected with your motherhood and all that entails. And you've got to be able to, re, to kind of reground yourself. Forget about your mistakes. Forget about what you didn't done, what you should have done. I, 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 you can't do nothing about that. All you have now is today and tomorrow forward. And you don't even have tomorrow because it's not promised. So you have today to be able to take the sword of the spirit and start thrusting. Start speaking the word of life, the living word, into the circumstances and the situations related to your motherhood. And watch and see what the Lord won't do. I leave you with this. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Can we read this together? Can y'all all see this? What's this? It says, let's read it. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. He's talking about that rhema. He says, it won't return empty. It'll accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. But you got to thrust. Ladies, if you don't thrust, you don't believe me? Ask my mom there. 
I remember I was laid in Sacred Heart Hospital. Laid up. Didn't know I was going to make it. All bloodied up, bleeding in the head, bleeding in the chest, bleeding in the face. Actually, I thought I was gone. My mom wasn't sitting there worrying, threatening. I bet she was out there speaking the word. Don't look at where your child is now. You have to speak that word over them. You have no, you have no idea what God has, what God has in store. But you got to have confidence in your weapon. The only offensive weapon you have, that sword of the spirit, that rhema, that spirit inspired use of verses and portions of scriptures for, for specific purposes, situations, and individuals. And thrust that sword. Thrust that sword.